Hello, my name is Brayden No. I'm a junior in Auburn High School, and this is my project on fabricating supercapacitors and optimization to electric vehicles. For a more detailed overview of this project, the QR code will guide you to the full research paper. Electric vehicles has been the rise in popularity and technologies such as regenerative braking is allowing to increase the efficiencies of EVs. In this braking method, the kinetic energy found on the vehicle is transferred back to the battery, allowing to recycle energy and increase the mileage per charge. However, the high transient power that occurs during vehicle acceleration and braking has been shown to be problematic to batteries due to overheating caused by high current. In addition to that, studies have been shown that automobile battery capacitance generally decreases over time, and the biggest contribution to that is the acceleration and the braking. The current solution to this problem is simple, by limiting the full potential of the battery. And this is where my research comes in. I have been researching supercapacitors for the last two years and it started when I was fascinated by supercapacitors potential in engineering applications. And as I was concluding my previous year's research which focused on proposing a new fabrication process that was safe and low cost, I read upon the problem that lithium ion batteries had in the electric vehicle and I realized the impact that supercapacitors could have on automobile industry. Supercapacitors, unlike batteries, have high power density, which means they're able to store and give out high current in short amount of time. And this was the capability that was lacking in an electric vehicle. If supercapacitor were to be used in EVs, the battery's lifetime would increase, which would increase the longevity of the vehicle. So why aren't any current electric vehicles embracing supercapacitors? Weight of these devices are the biggest reason. If you look inside a device, you'll find many layers of metal electrode that is rolled to form the cylindrical shape. And this is the biggest reason why supercapacitors are so heavy. Cost of commercial supercapacitors do not seem to have a concrete problem behind it, but in manufacturing, keeping products at low cost is crucial for business. In order to solve these current obstacles, my objective was to build a non-metal lightweight electrode for supercapacitor using low cost fabrication process that I have developed from my previous research. And using these samples, I plan to test the supercapacitors with batteries in an integrated system that uh, model the electric vehicle. Supercapacitors are constructed with two electrodes, an electrolyte, and a separator that allows the transfer of ions. As voltage is applied to the supercapacitor, ions in the electrolyte solution diffuses into the pores of the electrode of opposite charge, creating an electrostatic storage. The main focus of this research was in the fabrication of the electrode. Conductivity and porosity are the two biggest components to a high-performing supercapacitor. Activated carbon was deployed as the porous additive. This particular material had a surface area of 1800 meters squared per gram, or about three times the size of a basketball court in a single gram. The problem with just using activated carbon was that this material lacked in conductivity. So I found a material called graphene dispersion. Now if you know anything about graphene, you might know the difficulty of using this material in practical applications. Graphene dispersion is different from regular graphene as it is made by being mechanically exfoliated and it is put in water and surfactant. And what this creates is a slurry form of graphene, which allows me to create mixtures with activated carbon, much like an ink. Since I had two materials for the electrode, I needed to figure out the best way to find the ratios between the two. I first tried to rely on previous studies, however, because discovery of graphene dispersion was recent, there hasn't been much knowledge into this material. Furthermore, because supercapacitor's capacitance is also determined by poor accessibility of ions, I could not rely on most research consisting of multiple materials in the electrode due to the difference in the electrolyte. Most institutional researchers use organic electrolyte, which was way too dangerous in my home garage environment. Rather, I took a more creative approach. I created 16 supercapacitors consisting of different weight ratios of graphene dispersion and activated carbon, and I looked at the resulting capacitance. Within a few weeks, I found that ratios between 3 to 2 and 4 to 3 graphene dispersion and activated carbon respectively had the highest resulting capacitance. This ratio was later used in my feature testing that were more extensive. Extensive studies in the electrolyte has been performed in previous research and the electrolyte formula hasn't changed. The electrolyte is a type of an ionic liquid called dipetitic solvent. It is salt at liquid phase and this particular electrolyte happens to be liquid at room temperature. The reason for my use of deep eutectic solvent is self-explanatory. It provides a starting voltage of around 2 volts, which is excellent, and two materials requiring to make this electrolyte is choline chloride, which is used in chicken feed additive, and ethylene glycol, which is used in car antifreeze. These materials are low cost and abundant. Supercapacitor submersion process has been developed two years ago by inspiration in 3D battery electrode. 
The process starts from graphite felt, which is able to store electrode in all dimensions due to its physical characteristics that resembles a sponge. A traditional method paints the electrode to the current collector, which only allows two-dimensional storage of the electrode. Last year I have created the structure for this process, but the electrode material was unclear. With the finding from empirical analysis, I was able to finalize the submersion process. I acquired the temperature and time of defabrication from various supercapacitor researchers. This illustration demonstrates the manufacturing perspective of the supercapacitor. As you can see, the process does not require the use of advanced equipments, and robots used in current industrial manufacturing can be used to make these devices. This means that the manufacturing aspect of supercapacitors is easy to implement and the cost is low. The next step of my research was testing the performance of my supercapacitors. All device capacitance is measured with galvanic cycle measurements. Galvanic cycle is looking at the supercapacitor's voltage in relation with time when the device is being discharged at a certain current value. Discharge profile shows where the variables in the equations are established. The use of specific capacitance was for comparing between samples, as dividing the capacitance by gram eliminated the problem with samples having different capacitance due to mass difference. Using galvanic cycle, I tested my samples in various methods. However, it will be tedious to describe all my results. Instead, I will focus on one graph. The graph in this slide demonstrates the perfect example of the galvanic cycle. As the discharge current is increased, the discharge time is decreased. This is the inverse relationship between current and time in the capacitance equation. Next, I made the device so it would have around 50 ferrets in capacitance and compared to a commercial supercapacitor. I went to Maxwell Technologies website and chose a 50 ferret capacitor datasheet and found the capacitance and the mass of the device. I found the specific capacitance of the Maxwell device and my samples by dividing capacitance over mass. This resulted in my sample having three times higher specific capacitance than the best commercially available supercapacitor in the market right now. This means that if they had the same mass, then my sample would have three times higher capacitance, or if they had the same capacitance, my sample would be three times lighter. Next, I tested the electrode conductivity and charging voltage by looking at the temperatures. I found that between 2 and 6 volts, temperatures did not change significantly. The operational voltage of the current electrolyte is at 2 volts. This result showed that the electrode is able to handle a more advanced electrolyte with higher starting voltage. After finishing the experiment, I have accomplished my objective of creating a lightweight supercapacitor. Improvement of cost was harder to calculate. But compared to materials used in institutional researches, my devices were far cheaper. With all the main focus accomplished, I decided to have some fun with my supercapacitors. I designed a scale electric vehicle consisting of batteries and connected my supercapacitors in series. I used four devices, two in parallel and a set in series, which made 80 ferrets at 4.2 volts. This clip shows the vehicle running with battery only. This clip shows the vehicle running with supercapacitor only. As you can see, the voltage versus time graph is very different with supercapacitor and battery. This clip shows the combination of battery and supercapacitor module. As you can see, during the initial acceleration, the supercapacitor helps power the electric vehicle. Listed below are the reference that I have used in my research. I regret that I cannot answer any questions at this moment. Thank you for listening to this presentation.